today, we're really excited, um, as Anna laid out, for us to do the final installment of our um, commercial tenant empowerment um, curriculum with you all. And Jasmine, um, my colleague, is going to introduce herself as um, we launch into some uh, legal rights that have been um, that now exist as state law. And we'll also be going over um, a recap of the last two sessions um, and the eviction process. So Jasmine, take it away. Thanks, Hewlett. I'm just waiting for a uh, host permission so I could share my screen. Go ahead. Sorry about that, Jasmine. No worries. Um, okay. All right, the old portion of the screen. Can everyone see this a little bit? Let me know when it looks good. Looks good. Okay, oops. All right, cool. Um, well, thanks, Hewitt. Uh, as, as Hewitt said, my name is Jasmine Poyawan. I'm one of the program directors here at uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, um, the San Francisco Bay Area on the economic justice team. It's really an honor to be part um, of uh, the Empowered Commercial Tenant Program. I know that this is the third and, and last presentation, and um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about um, some of the policy or the policy that we've been working on this last legislative cycle, Senate Bill uh, 11 1103, which um, also called the California Commercial Tenant Protection Act of 2024, which um, I'll be talking about today after uh, Hewitt goes um talks about kind of an overview of what was already discussed during this program. So, um, you know, just kind of as a refresher, um, and, and I had to also learn this too, which is really great and exciting that um, I think the first session was about intro to commercial leasing, taking control of your commercial lease, and then hopefully um, today it all makes um a little bit like kind of a good flow to talk now about your commercial tenants rights because once you have the lease um the lease typically controls and um especially uh with the passage of sb 1103 there is or there are additional rights afforded to commercial tenants under the law so uh without further ado I just want to begin with a disclaimer that all of this in the presentation constitutes legal information, not legal advice. Um, uh, my understanding is that there are office hours for particular issues, which I just want to repeat and um, invite you all to attend um, and join. I'll, I'll also make myself available, I'll have my information at the end of the presentation to answer any specific questions about SB 1103. Uh, but for now, this presentation, we're not creating any attorney client privilege, just sharing information. Um, and with, uh, how will we share the, the information today? Well, today's roadmap is we'll start with Hewitt uh, to do a recap um, of what was uh, shared thus far in, in the commercial uh, tenant uh, um, empowerment program. Um, and then she's going to talk about the eviction process for uh, her for commercial tenant evictions, just to give us some context as to the worst case scenario, right? If you are facing an eviction from your landlord, what are some of your rights to defend yourself or what, what is the process so you're best equipped to defend yourself? And then from there, we'll talk about kind of the disparity of rights for commercial tenants versus residential tenants, um, a little bit more about the background as to why 
uh, we at the Lawyers Committee engaged in a campaign for more commercial tenant rights through SB 1103. Um, and then we'll talk about SB 1103, just the main three main components of language access, extended notice requirements, as well as lease transparency. And um, SB 1103 is not... Uh, in effect until January 1st of next year. And so this is actually our first Know Your Rights uh, training on, on this. And so uh, definitely invite everyone's feedback, but also very excited to share this information as um, it really is uh, um, very unique. Like California is the only state with these rights um, as of its passage. So. Uh, lastly, we're going to end um, the presentation with uh, just ideas of how we can look forward and to continue building momentum for commercial tenants, as well as give everyone a chance to ask questions and um, for us to provide any answers within uh, the presentation. So uh, with all that said, I'll pass to Hewitt to start on recap and eviction process and you can just let me know when you need me to switch slides. Awesome. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, so with that, just wanting to launch right into the next slide um, as uh, a, a way of sort of summarizing the last two um, modules that we did. Um, we decided to frame this as a best practices when dealing with lease issues. And so um, we've kind of pulled um, different uh, aspects of the training that um, would be most beneficial and kind of summarize it and organize it in, in sort of steps. Um, and so we are very much have, you know, done our best to be mindful of the reality that the cohort is a mix, uh, a blend of property owners and, and tenants. And, and so as tenant centered advocates, you know, our most of our um, focus has been on, you know, um, de de describing the leasing process and the um, the the um, aspects of which would be most relevant to tenants, but all of this is 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 important just in terms of being clear about what to expect on both sides too. And so, um, with that, um, just the main key takeaway, really, the first step, right, is just locating and reviewing um, the lease, right, because what is in writing matters. Um, and we recognize that some tenants might have leases that are in writing. Some tenants might be in an expired lease um, that's converted to a month-to-month -month lease. Um, and, and some tenants might not um, have a lease yet or, or might be negotiating for a new lease. And so still, it is important to know sort of what category you're in. Um, and even if you are on a month-to-month -month lease that... Um, you know, was was a consequence of an expired lease converting to one, the original agreement, some of those provisions might have carried over. And so with that background, um, it's, you know, at the end of the day, you're deferring to whatever the provisions are in the lease when dealing with specific issues and situations that might come up. Um, and there could be also exhibits or addendums too. A lot of times we'll see um, other ancillary agreements that are, um, you know, at the at the tail end of the original lease agreement. And so all of those um, documents are important because they're incorporated into, um, you know, essentially like the legal contract for the premises. So it's important that, you know, the tenants and, and landlords are aware of sort of what the entire agreement is. Um, and it can be helpful as well to understand how to interpret um, different provisions if there are references to the premises, um, there could be an exhibit with a site map um, and other helpful information to get a visual of what all that entails. And if you're subletting from someone, it's important to review the master lease that the master tenant has too. Um, and in, in terms of what your subleasing um, responsibilities and, and rights are. If you've leased your space for multiple lease terms, there may be uh, extensions to the document or um, amendments to the lease. So each of those amendments will also need to be reviewed as they might sort of change the dynamics in the original agreement. 
Um, and if you don't have a written lease, as I mentioned earlier, the question becomes, so what is the frequency um, of your rent payments, right? If you're paying monthly, then it could be that you're on a month-to-month -month tenancy and there are still certain rights that you have in terms of preserving your tenancy um, and getting specific noticing from the landlord before you know your tenancy is um, terminated. And if you're in a lease situation, if, you're, um, if your lease is greater than one year, it absolutely must be in writing for it to be legally enforceable by either party. And so once you've located and reviewed your lease, um, the next step is to understand the contents of it. So from the perspective of a tenant to understand what your rights and your obligations are, um, you know, this starts first with your payment obligations to the landlord, sort of what all constitutes rent. And so we talked a lot about this in the first presentation, um, divvying it up as there's the base rent um, to for, for the premises, the right to possess and use the premises. But then there could be what's known as additional rent. And that under that category are payments such as common area maintenance fees, also known as CAM fees. And so we'll talk a lot about that. Um, later on with what the this new law, SB 1103, um, does to make the process of payment and understanding sort of what the um, all those expenses are that the landlord is passing on to the tenant. In addition, there could be real estate property taxes, a, a share of that that the tenant is responsible to pay for. These are the landlord's property taxes. Depending on the type of lease you have, you may be responsible for these types of building expenses. Um, and there might even be property insurance. Um, if you're responsible for common area, maintenance fees, real estate, property taxes, and then the third category of um, uh, property insurance, then you're in what's called a triple net lease. If you're only paying for the base rent, so just the right to rent the property, um, that would be a gross lease. That's a very common, no, normally that's just the most straightforward lease. So it all just depends. Um, and so it's just important to know what your total rent payment obligations are and, and some of the ways in which they might be defined. So we put in quotes, um, again, these slides will be shared. We put in quotes some um, technical terms um, that's important to just be mindful of as, as these are um, you know often imported into lease agreements and they have um, you know, there it's just a good signal that there's that there's a lot more to the picture um, when when you see these these types of definitions in place. And another really important thing to bear in mind as it does relate to your payment obligations, and then also one of the most key features is just what is the space and that you're renting, and that's the premises. Um, and have you confirmed the square footage? Sometimes rent might be, um, you know, per uh, might be a dollar amount per square foot, and that could be very um, useful for you to identify in the lease, especially when it comes time to negotiate the rent and having that baseline of rent that's relative to the amount of space you have can be um, tremendously advantageous. What we've also seen in terms of like square footage of the premises is also understanding what the total square footage of the property is too. Especially if you're in a multi-tenant building, you might be responsible to pay for shared spaces. And so just getting a sense of what the actual, um, you know, the actual building, um, the building square footage is relative to your space is important to make sure you have an accurate picture of the tenant's pro rata share. Another thing as to the payment obligations as you're exploring sort of your rights and your obligations is have you signed a guarantee of the lease? And so we talked about this um, in, in the trainings where um, there might be situations where you signed a lease as a tenant, as a legal entity, let's say a limited liability company, but then the landlord, um, you know, for whatever reason, often it's because it might be a new entity and you haven't um, maybe established the business enough to show um, that, you know, that there's that there's a reliance that the landlord can have for you to make your rent payment obligations as, as to the historical financials of the company. Um, they might obligate the individual owner. So they might in, in obligate the individual tenant um, in their personal capacity to guarantee the lease obligation payment, rent payment, and um, financial and, and legal obligations in the lease. And so that's what's called a guarantee of the lease. Um, and so really important to know sort of what the full scope of liability is under the lease and who all is responsible.
And so the next thing um, moving along from payment obligations is sort of what are your repair and your maintenance obligations? So what have you promised to do in terms of the upkeep of the property? And so getting a clear picture of what the scope of that is. If you're in negotiations, um, just, you know, trying to get that really limited and tailored to just the interior of the premises and that everything that's exterior and structural belongs to the landlord in terms of um, responsibilities. Other things to identify, are there any other rights that the tenant has, um, you know, to enforce against the landlord? Um, let's say it's also known as abatement. It could be abatement rights too. And in this case, abatement means any time that the rent might be reduced if something happens or doesn't happen. Like let's say if the landlord has promised to give the tenant access to the building, like unrestricted access. And if the landlord, um, does not perform that um, obligation and um, to the benefit of the tenant, then the tenant might have the right to abate the rent, might have the right to, to reduce the rent for the amount of time that the landlord didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, also, if the landlord doesn't make certain repairs, um, you know, this this is this sometimes might exist in the lease. More often than not, it's not there, but it is important to make sure that, you know, you're you're really understanding the full scope of what your abatement rights are, because that could be one, you're entitled to it, and then two, it could be a powerful way to get the landlord to um, comply. And then um, other things too is if the landlord is obligated to provide um, the tenants or in utilities or sanitation, janitorial services, even landlord improvements. If the landlord has promised to make certain um, certain modifications to the premises, um, you know, before the before your rent payment obligations um, commence. Uh, those are all really important things to understand in terms of what moves you can make um, in, in, within, within the lease. And the last thing to identify is what's a legal exit from the lease, ways in which, you know, if, if something goes wrong, you're in a, you know, you're, you've hit some financial hardship, can you get out of the lease legally? And so being able to locate any subleasing and assigning rights is, is a really powerful way to do that. And then next, um, we're going to focus in on what happens when something goes wrong, right? So from whatever vantage point you are as a tenant, um, whether you're in a current um, fixed term lease, um, whether you're on a month to month, or you're just about to negotiate a lease, um, you still have the tools of communication and negotiation at any, at any point. And so it's important to communicate with the landlord in writing to solve whatever issues might come up um, during your tenancy. And so explaining your situation in accordance with any lease notice provisions, if you do have a lease, there should be a section on noticing sort of how official notice is sent to the landlord. Um, usually it's in writing, usually there's an address, maybe an email, might even permit phone calls, but most of the time it's in writing. Um, and even if you do make a phone call, it's important to follow it up in writing. Um, you want to define or you want to specify the um, the hardship that you're facing, let's say if it's affecting your inability to pay full rent or if you've fallen behind on rent, um, being able to, you know, kind of paint that picture for the landlord um, and also propose a solution. So this is why the assignment and the subleasing um, outs, you know, the exit plan is also really important to locate to see if that could be a potential resolution. Um now, if you're in a situation where you're dealing with problematic or unlawful behavior of the landlord, um, let's say the landlord's been negotiating in bad faith, has been harassing you, making, you know, um, kind of interrupting your businesses, coming onto the premises um, in an unauthorized fashion without notice, um, if there's been a violation of the lease, right, to be able to point that out um, and um, demand that the landlord cure that or stop doing what um, you know they're doing as it is a violation of the lease. Um, and again, keeping all communications, whether it be with the landlord or the property manager in writing. And then lastly, it's kind of tied together, but it's also negotiating a deal that works for you. If you have a solution that you need um, to achieve being able to kind of um, use the, the tool of negotiation, um, to get what you want. If you're negotiating a new lease, it's important um, researching, uh, researching, you know, market right, mark the market rents, um, or communicating with other tenants about if there are other tenants that could be a powerful way to kind of strengthen your leverage when you're negotiating new terms, especially if the landlord is claiming that they can't give you what you want or it's unreasonable. Um, that could definitely be again uh, one one strategy to make your make your lease or your negotiation more persuasive. 
Um, and kind of focusing in on ways in which uh, you can sort of settle at the outcome that you can live with, but then using the framing of mutually beneficial um, kind of uh, give and take. I think that that has been really, um, that that can be really a bit, very, um, uh, I, you can, you should, you can get some gains when you're doing that, right? Because, um, you know, kind of painting it as a way in which the landlord wins by giving you what you want. Um, and then just to note, right, again, even if you already have a lease, you can always try to renegotiate to persuade the landlord to amend the agreement um, if the lease allows it. Often the lease does allow amendments so long as both parties um, sign um, a written agreement to amend the um, original understanding. Um, but again, just wanting to note that in, in, in the prior presentation, there were some questions just about what do we do if we've already um, you know, if there is no formal process for negotiating a new lease quite yet, because you're still you're still um, carrying out the original term, there is there is always a chance whether or not, you know, you'll get exactly what you want is another question. But in terms of being able to strategize to revisit certain terms and um, try to reach a voluntary agreement, it's still a possibility. Um, and we just underscoring to remember what you bring to the table. That was a big feature of both presentations, just your value sort of informing what your priorities and your needs are and recognizing that your, your um, you know, uh, a critical, uh, your business is providing a critical um, cash flow for the property owner landlord and, you know, they need you. So just being able to um, stay grounded in that is really essential. All right. So that was like a download, a lot of information trying to condense the two presentations in a couple slides. But now we're going to segue to a, an entirely different conversation, right? What happens when you are sued in an unlawful detainer case? Let's say, um, you know, landlord refuses to negotiate um, a back back rent agreement or, you know, you've, you, you, you're you unable to, to pay rent moving forward and you've fallen behind on that and you can't reach a negotiated resolution with the landlord. And for whatever reason, landlord has decided to commence an eviction process, right? We want to kind of deconstruct what all that means. And, and the next part of the webinar is going to focus on that. Um, so unlawful detainer is, you know, short, you know, we, the shorthand of that is UD case, you might hear UD, UD throughout the training. So that's what, that's what it means. And it's pretty much synonymous with evictions. It's just the legal term um, that's used um, in, in the actual procedure. Uh, and so just wanting to start off with if you receive a three day notice or a summons and complaint, um, for an unlawful detainer lawsuit, contact an attorney immediately, right? Seek legal assistance to really understand what your next move has to be according to the civil procedure um, so that you can preserve your rights um, and your voice in the process. Note that a landlord cannot lock a tenant out of their space without going through the legal process. This is a very common misconception. Um, we have a bunch of a bunch of folks contacting us saying that they never received a notice to vacate. Um, they never had their day in court, but the landlord has locked them out. That's completely illegal. Um, there, it, the only way a tenant can get vacated from their unit, officially evicted, is by a court order that's enforced by the sheriff. Um, and so we just want to underscore that and we'll get into a little bit of the details in the next slide. Um, in fact, an unlawful, just one note, thanks, Jasmine, on the last slide. In fact, an unlawful detainer um, or sort of an unlawful detainer uh, or unlawful lockout would trigger punitive damages and fines and, um, ordered by the courts. So, yeah, just wanting to mention really, really highlight that. All right. So next slide. Um and so the next slide is just an overview of the eviction process, right? Um, it is, you know, this this flow chart is just intended to show a little bit in a visual way what happens in the actual court procedure. And so the triggering event is the notice. So a landlord must deliver what's what's called a valid notice, not just any notice, not just sending you a text, not just sending you, you know, a post-it, um, you know, or just coming to you in person and saying, get out. It has to be a valid notice and it's and it's bolded because there are actually legal parameters and technicalities around that. And they have to wait until it expires. 
Um, and we'll talk a bit about that as well, moving on to the next slides. But want to also mention that only then, after the notice expires, can the landlord then file a lawsuit, an eviction lawsuit in court. And then when you are served the summons and complaint by the landlord, then you must file, the tenant must file an answer in five court days. And so again, it's high, it's bolded because court days, the legal, there's a, there's a legal way of calculating that. It excludes court observed holidays and weekends. But again, when you contact an attorney trying to get the, 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 the accurate sort of um, calendar date upon when you're supposed to respond is one of the, one of the important first steps too. So you know what to do. The next slide offers a simplified breakdown of the process. So like I mentioned, um, the landlord first has to deliver notice to the tenant. And so I'm going to talk about what a valid notice is in the next slide, because that's a really critical part of all of this. Most of most of the situations related to eviction, evictions kind of fall in this category, figuring out what is a valid notice. Has that has it actually been met by the landlord? Okay, so that's one. And then second is the notice expiration is important. What is the date by which um, the tenant has to fix the problem um, before they will be found in default, right? So um, in, in, in terms of the eviction process proceeding moving forward. And then the next stage is that, um, you know, after the notice has expired, then the landlord can make the next move. Um, the landlord has filed an unlawful detainer case and the tenant has been served the paperwork. So again, all of this is like a very um, technical process. Um, and these are important things to, to note even as you're, as you're going through the process, because if there's a misstep by the landlord, that's, that's one way to get the lawsuit thrown out in, in, in the defenses that you will file next in your answer. So after you've been served the summons and complaint, the next step is filing an answer. So um, the complaint is activating the lawsuit by the landlord. And then um, as the defendant in the lawsuit, the tenant gets to file an answer and, and to have their day in court, essentially to be heard um, and then have their day in court. And so within the deadline, tenant filing the answer is key. It's that five court day deadline. And then lastly, you're waiting for a trial after the answer has been filed, then the court, um, you know, I think the, the landlord will have some say in terms of the calendar to some extent. But if there is not a settlement before that, then the case will go to trial. Okay, so what is a valid notice? A valid notice is a written document from the landlord to the tenant. And so notices are the very first document received in the eviction process. So you may have heard of a three-day notice to pay or quit. Quit means to move out, um, a three-day notice to perform covenants, which are specific actions in the lease, um, usually, uh, and, and you know, there it could be a three-day notice to quit, a 30- or 60-day notice to quit, um, and there could be lease-designated notices. So there might be certain lease-designated deadlines that have to be met in order to, um, you know, remain compliant. So those deadlines actually govern over the statutory deadlines. The next slide gets into a bit more of what um, California does and does not require in terms of the format for the notices. So California does not have a required format. So notices may vary, but certain information must be included. Um, so there's like substantive requirements. So for example, a three-day notice to pay rent must be written and include the date that the demand was served on the tenant the names and the address of tenant or tenants, all the tenants. If one tenant is missing, if it's like multiple tenants, then that could be one way to get the lawsuit filed out for an effective notice. Third is the statement that the tenant owes rent and must pay within three days or the landlord will file an eviction lawsuit. And then the last thing is the total amount of rent that's due and owed. So I have an illustration on the next slide of this. So hypothetically, you could get a written, handwritten notice, a note taped on your business door from the landlord. You know, you owe me two months of rent, pay tomorrow or you're evicted, right? Um, you could get a type letter in your business mailbox, three-day notice to pay rent or quit to Mr. Commercial Tenant. You missed the rent payments for two months for where you're renting and the address there. Pay the rent within three days or I will sue you. You could get a typed letter, hand um, or a typed letter or a hand delivered to the commercial tenant's 19-year-old son, you know, and it could indicate the date, three-day notice to pay rent or quit. 
to Mr. Commercial Tenant, you missed the rent payments for two months for rent for 1234 Restaurant Drive, San Francisco, California. Pay the $5,000 for rent within three days or I'll sue you. So which one is valid? Well, we're going to see on the next slide. Um, you know, for the first one, it's missing the tenant's full commercial property address, the estimate of how much money is owed, and the date served. So just because it's on a post-it, it's, it's handwritten, doesn't necessarily um, invalidate it. It's actually missing sort of substantive content that the tenant is entitled to um, for valid notice. The next, next um, you know, uh, typed up notice, right, is an es it's missing an estimate of how much the money is owed and the date that it's served. And then the last notice that was delivered to commercial tenants, um, 19 year old son, while the content is valid, um, the notice is not delivered directly to the tenant. Uh, and so a copy must be mailed to the tenant at their business address as well. So you can see how it gets really, really technical, but these are not evictions. These are not, these are not valid. This is not you sort of, you know, when you're getting these types of, um, you know, paperwork from the landlord, it can feel like you're being evicted and that can certainly um, and, and naturally create a lot of anxiety. But most of our um, conversations with tenants who are in this ordeal is that they have not been validly served yet and nor have they been evicted because only the court can evict you. These are all just signaling that a, um, a lawsuit may be impending. And a lawsuit doesn't mean that there's a judgment quite yet. You still have an opportunity to fight it. And so that's one of our main takeaways. A little bit more on the next slide about invalid notice as we're wrapping um, some of this up. And I do have um, a link to a guide that um, further reiterates. It also has most of this content in there. And so you can refer to it if we're flying by, if we're really going through this fast. But um, main thing is invalid notice, right? So an invalid notice does not prevent an eviction per se. You know, when an invalid notice expires, the landlord can still pursue an unlawful detainer case. All it means is just that you can use the invalid notice as a defense in your answer. So um, let's say that, you know, the you get the invalid notice, you, you realize it's invalid, but then the landlord proceeds to file a complaint um, for an unlawful detainer action against you. It just means that now you have a slam dunk case to get the, the, the case, you still have a slam dunk way to get the case dismissed because you'll just note that in your answer that it was invalid. And so this could potentially throw out the lawsuit, but, but the landlord could just correct the notice and then you know start the process all over again um and so anyways it's just it's just to help um show that there are moves and counter moves in the process um and just to be aware of what your rights are the next slide okay we are on the next slide so once you have been served let's moving on from the notice so once you have been served a summons and complaint now you file an answer as the tenant so once the deadline specified in the notice has passed, so let's say like the three-day pay or quit, the landlord can start the legal case for eviction by filing a summons and complaint and then serving the tenant in a copy of it. And so the tenant's first legal step in the unlawful case, as I mentioned, is to file an answer, to file an answer to have your, your response, um, you know, your, your story, your defense um, filed with the court. And you do that within five court days of receiving the complaint from the landlord in the summons, um, the summons and complaint. So if you as a tenant fail to file an answer, you know, the consequences are really dry, dire. So with the court, um, you know, you have to file it within four or five court dead days. And so if you don't do that, the landlord can get what's called a default judgment for, for, from the court against the tenant. And the tenant automatic, that means that the tenant automatically loses the case and that the sheriff can lock the small business um, owner out of the space. Um, now, with the caveat that there could be a way to vacate um, to sort of set aside the default judgment if you get there in time. But again, that's just to um, exemplify the, the significance of that five court day um, procedure. All right. So after... Um, you know, let's say the next step in the lawful detainer, the you, know, you filed the answer, 
then what happens? So there will be after that a notice of trial sent by the court after a trial date has been requested by the landlord. So this is a very, it's, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty as to what the timeline is. It also depends on how the landlord is moving. But again, you will get court papers and, and documentation as to when that trial date is. In the next few weeks, um, you know, following that uh, it should be when the trial will be held. And so, um, in a simplified way, if the landlord wins, the sheriff will lock you out or lock the tenant out, not the landlord. The landlord does is not involved in this process. And if the tenant wins, then the case is over. Um, and so that um, concludes sort of the eviction process. Um, the next slide is a, a QR code to our unlawful detainer guide for small business owners to provide um, all that I, I discussed and shared on here, a little bit more details too, especially getting into some of the technical language. And so um, it's there for you now, and then we'll also share the slides and you can access it there. So with that, I'll um, hand it over to Jasmine. Thanks, Hewitt. That was really comprehensive. Um, yeah, a lot of information. <laughs> I want to recognize that. And um, it's good that we have the guide and really encourage everyone to um, look back at the slides once they're sent out and look at the guide and take advantage of office hours if, you know, a an eviction or unlawful detainer um, is something that you're worried about. Um, but with all that information, I wanted to move us along to a little bit more about um, the new rights that are afforded to commercial tenants through SB 1103 uh, and tying it back into Hewitt's part of the presentation and, you know, thinking about, well, what can you, what are, what are some answers, like what's a way or what is some substantive arguments you could put in your answer to fight back against um, a summons and complaint or, you know, a lawsuit to evict you. And uh, fortunately, SB 1103 provides uh, new arguments, uh, new ways to defend yourselves. And so just want to kind of draw that connection. But before we jump into the substance, I want to give a little bit uh, more background and context for uh, how we even got to SB 1103, how we landed on the particular rights, as well as just what our vision is to continue supporting um, small business owners like yourselves, commercial tenants, um, and also underscoring, you know, there's still work to be done. SB 1103 is not a silver bullet. Um, and we're really looking forward to working with you all and hearing from you all as well as to what are other rights or what are other interventions that um, we can help advocate for and build into our policy campaigns. So um, with that, I want to just give out some statistics and numbers to you know, highlight why we're focused on specific sector of businesses. Like when we say small businesses, I think the Small Business Administration defines small business as any business making under like, I think $50 million a year in revenue. And so obviously that's not, um, I mean, that isn't our, uh, our, our client population. And so really want to focus in and hone in on um, what we consider micro businesses. And so uh, micro businesses defined uh, under the laws, um, businesses with five employees or less um, of all the business in the businesses in the United States, 85% of them are micro businesses and fall under this definition. Um, I know this is my first time meeting you all and being part of these discussions, um, but I was told that many of you uh, would fall under um, this, this definition of micro business. Uh, and so micro businesses make up a lot, right? So in California specifically, there are 4 million micro businesses. These are numbers from 2020, and so um, I'm sure four years later, there's way more, but kind of creating this baseline, there's 4 million micro businesses in California. 
the argument from some of the legal service providers, businesses, business providers um, to micro businesses is that we should invest in micro businesses because if we think about it, the majority of micro businesses just have one person, like the one entrepreneur running the business. But if we think about building the capacity of micro businesses, if even just half of the total micro businesses in California hired one more person, then you would see 2 million jobs in California created. 2 million jobs would make a huge um, uh, uh, make a huge dent in the unemployment rate. And so um, if we, we go back to our mission at Lawyers Committee of helping to close the racial wealth gap, also creating opportunities for self-sufficiency um, in marginalized communities and communities of color, this is very much an important focus for us. Um, and micro businesses also give back to the community. Um, based on our community partner, uh, Cameo Network, um, based on their uh, research of their 21,000 members in, in California, uh, their micro businesses, 21,000, contributed $1.5 billion in economic activity. Um, through raising state revenues, decreasing demand for government services, and also reinvesting in both their local and state economies. And so micro businesses really are the backbone of um, our economy. And so we want to focus on that. Unfortunately, um, maybe I'm preaching to the choir as you all are the business owners, you all are putting in the work day to day. But from our research and just anecdotally, we know how hard it is to run a sm uh, small business. Um, unfortunately, today making uh, running a small business, there's a 50 to 80 percent failure rate of small businesses. Uh, and that's usually due to a lot of things, lack of financing, but also lack of adequate support services and technical services or assistance. And so um, we acknowledge that here at Lawyers Committee, and we try to do our part to fill that the void of um, support services as well as technical assistance. But we also understand that there are so many other pressures. Uh, there was once, um, or there was a survey done back in 2020 of nonprofits working with small businesses in California. And um, of the respondents, 86% of them reported that the small businesses that they provide support to are facing some type of displacement from their communities. Um, and displacement meaning, you know, being forced out of their communities, being forced out of uh, business altogether. And if we think about it, you know, there are a lot of displacement pressures and we could think about it in the Bay Area specifically, these pressures are very salient, right? There's rent increases, cost of living in California, unfair lease terms, uh, exorbitant added fees like the, the common area maintenance fees that Hewitt had um, reviewed us on, limited English proficiency. So, a lot of small business owners or micro businesses are owned by immigrants who um, may not be uh, proficient in English and are very vulnerable to um, getting taken advantage of through lease terms that they don't understand completely. And then also just in general, there are fewer protections for commercial tenants than residential tenants. And we already know being in the state of California, being in the Bay Area, residential tenants also, you know, need protection, also um, are worth building momentum and movement to make housing affordable. And just imagine for commercial tenants, as you all know, it's even much harder given the fact that there's an assumption in local and state law and even federal law that commercial tenants are more savvy or have access to more resources, to legal resources to be able to defend themselves from, um, you know, from evictions or from any other legal recourse that they may be faced with. And that's simply untrue for a lot of the business and I, businesses, and I'd say even all of the businesses that 
we serve here at Lawyers Committee, and it's simply untrue, um, I think, from what we've observed across the state through working with um, a coalition of uh, what we, we call ourselves commercial tenant um, uh, support providers, uh, just a coalition of not just legal aid um, service providers, but also small business assistance providers across California. Um, so we have us, Lawyers Committee, we've worked with um, Betsetic, Inclusive Action to the City, Public Council, which are all based in, um, in Southern California, as well as the Cameo Network, which is uh, nationwide, but has a um, specific focus on California. And I'm bringing them up, them up to say that we um, all kind of recognize these pressures of displacement all across California. It just isn't in the Bay Area. It's happening in Los Angeles. It's happening um, you know, in Sacramento, all over. And through our direct legal services and looking at the trends um, since we pride ourselves in data-driven policy. So our policy solutions are coming directly from uh, the clients that we serve. When they come through our doors and we do our intakes, we really take the data that we collect from those interviews uh, seriously and we compile and really look at the trends. And we were seeing that Folks were facing unlawful detainers. Folks were facing um, unfair leasing and just non-transparency in their leasing terms. And seeing that this was happening all across the state, our coalition came together to come up with policy solutions um, that we could pass on the state level. We partnered with um, Senator Caroline Menhivar, who is based in the San Fernando Valley, um, she's the woman in the blue blazer in the picture, uh, and we all became co-sponsors for what was later called SB 1103 or the California Commercial Tenant Protection Act. And um, this is all to say kind of like how we got to this point and how we got to the substance, which I'm going to share um, in this next section. Uh, but I wanted to share that experience, one, to give context, but two, to also encourage everyone on this call that, um, you know, fighting, asserting your, your rights and seeking out services and partnering um, with legal service providers or any other type of organization that provides business support, um, I think it's really important to start building a moment momentum for commercial tenants, which we'll talk about later. Um, but before that, uh, let's break down the law. And again, I'm hoping for some patience here. This is going to be the first uh, presentation on SB 1103. So um, hopefully you all are <laughs> in for a treat. And I understand that there's some property owners on this call as well. Um, and I think that SB 1103 is not just a good law for commercial tenants, but also a great law for commercial landlords too, to understand and have parameters that I think prior to SB 1103 remained unclear or ambiguous and creating conflict between landlords and tenants. And so that's how we've presented SB 1103 and that's how we hope it will roll out once it's effective January 1st. Um, so before doing that, I wanna talk about what SB or who does SB 1103 apply to? So in the law, there is a, a defined term called qualified commercial tenant. So SB 1103, and this had to happen due to um, just passing policy and having to negotiate with your opposition and having to make sure that we passed some rights versus no rights. But right as of now, or starting January 1st, SB 1103 only applies to um, qualified commercial tenants, which I'll define with leases executed or signed or tenancies that commence or start or are renewed on or after January 1st, 2025. 
If the lease does not contain a provision about building operating costs, which honestly, most leases do, but if you are um, in a situation where you have a very simple lease or you don't even um, have a written lease, which we could talk about, <laughs> um, it you qualify or SB 1103 will apply to you. If you have a lease, before January 1st, 2025, that does not contain any language around building operating costs. Also, it doesn't matter what date um, your lease started, but if you have a month to month ten tenancy, then SB 1103 applies to you as well, as long as you're a qualified commercial tenant. So, Thinking about how, where you qualify or if you qualify under SB 1103, you first need to look at your lease, kind of seeing what date it was signed. Does it have any mention of building operating costs? Do you even have a written lease? Are you just a month to month tenancy? If so, um, then this is one of maybe like the few instances where being months to month and not having something concrete in writing um, is, is beneficial. Uh, and then once you have that, let's say that all checks out, then you have to ask yourself, are you a qualified commercial tenant? What does that mean? Well, it means you're either a micro business, so you're a micro business of five employees or less, or if you're a restaurant, then the employee count goes up to 10 employees or less, so you're afforded 10 employees or less. And if you are a, a nonprofit, since SB 1103 also applies to nonprofits, you are afforded 20 employees or less. So if you fall under this definition of qualified commercial tenant and your lease checks out, then SB 1103 applies to you. Um, who, like, so how do you avail of, of SB 1103? It's something called self-attestation. So you must notify your landlord of your qualified status Meaning in writing, you need to say, I, I qualify under SB 1103. I am a micro business or I'm a restaurant. I'm a nonprofit with X number of employees. So you must mention how many employees you have. And it has to be before you execute the lease or right when you execute the lease. Um, but if your tenancy is week to week, month to month, or less than a month, let's say you don't have a lease, then all you have to do is just let them know in writing that you're a qualified tenant. It doesn't matter when you tell them, it just matters that you do tell them. And they're supposed to take your word for it. So obviously I wouldn't lie because um, you are held um, under perjury, right? Like to be honest about the self-attestation, um, but there also isn't a system where landlords are like required to police how many employees you have or um, you're not required to show or prove it. Um, but obviously, you should be honest with it. So that is all you need to do to assert that you qualify under SB 1103. Um, so what does that mean then? Why would you want to do this? Well, SB 1103 will provide three key tenant rights. Um, we have kind of called this or coined them as one, language access, two, extended notice, and three, lease transparency, which we're going to break down um, each individually. Um, but as quick summary with language access, uh, SB 1103 will require commercial leases be provided to tenants in the language that they were negotiated, as long as they fall under the five main languages, which we'll talk about. Um, this is very important and addresses the need of um, or the problem that we started seeing about clients who are limited um, English per, or have limited English proficiency and were given leases that they didn't understand. So this is something that we hope um, can address that. The second right is extended notice. And um, thankfully for Hewitt's presentation, we understand how important notice is, right? And so, um, and this is for property managers out there too and, and the audience that 
um, there are going to be um, more notice requirements to follow um, if there's a rent increase or if you're trying to terminate a lease with, um, with a tenant. And then the last right is lease transparency, which um, there's going to be new parameters and guidelines around how landlords can charge tenants building operating costs. So the extra fees, right, of common area maintenance, because prior to SB 1103, we were seeing a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of landlords not understanding that they couldn't pass on certain expenses and seeing tenants um, bearing the costs of uh, expenses that um, were, you know, shouldn't have been um, bared by them. So uh, with that said, we'll go to language access first. And so what SB 1103 does technically, um, and, you know, this might be super, super, superfluous, <laughs> but I think it's important to understand if you want to look at the actual laws and whatnot. But uh, what SB 1103 does is it amends um, the California Civil Code, Section 1632, which already exists and requires written translation of like certain contracts. Um, but what SB 1103 does, it just adds commercial leases to that list. So in the state of California, the first or the top five non-English languages spoken are Spanish, Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, and Korean. So if you're a tenant and you negotiate your lease in any of these languages, then the landlord is also then required to provide a written translation of the lease in those languages to you. Um, it doesn't matter if you as a tenant negotiates the lease through your own interpreter, you cannot waive this right. So even if you use an interpreter, if you still need a written lease translated, you are under law um, legally entitled to that. And so um, if the landlord doesn't do that, then that can be used as a reason to break your lease. Um, and, you know, that that could be a reason, right, for, for some folks. So language access, uh, I think, is very key and really important. And that is um, one of the main and kind of more straightforward rights that SB 1103 affords. Um, the next one is about extended notice. So um, extended notice for if the landlord tries to increase your rent or tries to terminate your lease, basically. Not necessarily evicting you, but giving you notification, right, that, hey, we're not going to renew your lease. And so what we started noticing was that um, the existing law gives about 30 days. So 30 days notice is all landlord needs to give a tenant. And that for a small business is just not enough time because it's you definitely need more than 30 days to one, decide whether or not the rent increase can work within your your monthly budget, but also if you decide that it can't and you need to find a new space, sometimes it takes way more than 30 days to sell your inventory or to get a new build out on, at, at a new space. And so we were recognizing that a lot of businesses that were given rent increase notices or termination of lease notices just simply had to go out of business or take a break from their business because they just had nowhere else to go or didn't have enough time um, to get their business up and running elsewhere. And so um, we wanted to address this through SB 1103 by one, um, amending California Civil Code Section 800, 827, which addresses rent increases so now with SB 1103 starting in January 1st, it reads that if a rent increase is greater than 10% of your existing rent, then landlords must give qualified commercial tenants at least 90 days notice before the effective date of a rent increase. So we extended that from 30 days to 90 days. 
if the tenant or but if the rent increase is less than 10 percent though then um uh the notice required is just th at least 30 days and so we were unable to um increase that but for any increase greater than 10 percent which we have seen a lot of that the, those rent increases then um, 90 days is required um in terms of termination uh SP 1103 amends California Civil Code section 1946.1. So the landlord, instead of 30 days now, must give 60 days notice prior to the proposed date of termination. However, if the qualified commercial tenant occupied the property for less than a year, then the landlord only needs to give 30 days. So if you've been in your space for more than a year, then you are afforded 60 days notice. And like you had said, you know, if you're not given proper notice requirements, that could be a defense in an answer in any type of law, like in an unlawful detainer lawsuit. So I want us to keep that in the back of the mind or your mind as, as we read some of these new rights that SB 1103 um, affords, affords you. Um, oh yeah, feels weird kind of just talking at y'all, but I promise we'll have our Q and A. So I hope everyone's writing down questions if you have them. Um, this last part. Okay. So the last right is lease transparency. So we added a new section or SB 1103 added a new section to the California civil code section 1950.9, where we put guidelines and rules on what landlords can recover as building operating costs from the, the tenant. So as Hewitt mentioned earlier on the recap that some leases, right, you could have a triple net lease, you could have, you know, different types of leases where the tenant is required to pay, you know, part of the property insurance or taxes, insurance, like, Landlords are are able to pass on a number of different fees to their tenants. Well, before SB 1103, again, there weren't any like kind of rules or standards, and so some we saw some unscrupulous landlords passing on, um, you know, back taxes from ten years ago, um, and surprising tenants with, um monthly rents that were like thousands of dollars um, if you took into the fees, P effectively putting businesses out of business. And so we wanted to address that and rein that in a little bit. And so, you know, it's not a, a perfect solution, but I think this is a step in the right direction of providing some transparency, which will help tenants, but also help landlords to understand what is proper to pass on to their tenants um, to keep tenants stabilized and in a position to continue, um, you know, renting out and, and, and running their business. So what this new law says is that a landlord shall not charge a fee to recover building operating costs unless and bear with me, there's a lot of text, but I'll try to break it down. Um, the costs are allocated proportionately per tenant by square footage or another method substantiated through supporting documentation. So SB 1103 now says that landlords need to show some type of formula, right? Like if they're renting out a building and there's a number of tenants, they can't just pass on the majority of their operating expenses to one tenant versus another tenant, which, you know, happens. Like sometimes landlords will play favorites or or whatnot, right? Or they'll have some arbitrary reasoning for why they wanted to charge this tenant versus that tenant. Well, now SB 1103 says you can't do that. You need to show us some sort of formula as to how you're allocating the costs amongst your different tenants, whether that be by square footage or by proportion of the, um, or uh, maybe by the type of business, but the landlord must show that. Um, 
The next thing is that uh, they shall not charge a fee to recover building operating costs unless the costs have been incurred within the previous 18 months or are reasonably expected to be incurred within the next 12 months based on reasonable estimates. So no more going back 10 years to recover late ta like property tax fees. Um, so it has to be within the last 18 months. And then you can, landlords can predict maybe in 12 months that they're going to have these expenses, but they need to show that it's reasonable, right? So if they're thinking that they're going to redo their landscape in 12 months, they should show that they already have plans for the landscaping, or maybe the landscaping contractor could provide an invoice or an estimate saying, okay, we're going to start work in three months, right? And so um, the landlord must show that these costs will actually be incurred um, or have been incurred in the past 18 months. So we're putting some sort of um, uh, parameters around that now. And then the landlord must also provide notice before the lease is executed, stating that the tenant may inspect supporting documentation of building operating costs upon written request. So what this just means now is that if you as a qualified commercial tenant want to inspect the documents that the landlord is saying, like, these are my expenses, this is how much money I have to pay, and therefore that's why I'm charging you this amount, you can now, under law, as a tenant, say, okay, we'll prove it. Show us the supporting documentation. Whereas prior to SB 1103, you just had to take your landlord's word from it, for it. Sometimes landlords would provide supporting documentation. Sometimes they wouldn't. And so now you must give, be given notice that you have the right to do that. In addition to that, landlords must comply with that. So within 30 days, actually. So within 30 days of the written request, the landlord must provide supporting documentation. Um, and then we have two requirements, right? Landlords can no longer pass on costs that include expenses that the tenant already paid for to a third party. Believe it or not, landlords have done, <laughs> have done that. Um, and then also the costs do not include expenses that a third party, tenant, or insurance company has already reimbursed the landlord. And so um, these are all very like common sense. Um, and honestly, we wanted to make sure it was put in writing in the law so that again, unscrupulous landlords would not be able to take advantage advantage of tenants. And so um, lease transparency, hopefully, um, well, I, I know <laughs> for a fact from our clients and the data that we've seen in our clients, um, will definitely make an impact to help and also hopefully help landlords to keep everything um, above water. So lastly on here, a landlord cannot charge building operating costs until they provide supporting documentation to the tenant. So you can request a make written request, but um, the landlord is still also obligated to provide um, the supporting documentation. Um, two definitions that I think are very important are building operating costs. Uh, in the law, they are defined as um, anything that is incurred or expenses incurred on behalf of the tenant for the operation, maintenance, or repair of the property. Right. And that's a definition that is probably going to be debated and there are going to be like court cases defining what that definition actually means. But for now, um, a non-exhaustive list of what building operating costs include maintenance of common areas. So common area maintenance fees. So like if there's a lobby in your building, um, there's utilities not separately metered and property taxes and assessments. Uh, supporting documentation is also an important definition. Uh, supporting documentation must be a dated and itemized quote, contract, receipt, or invoice from a licensed contractor or a provider of services 
That must include how the costs are allocated and the landlord signed and dated attestation that the documentation and costs are true. So the landlords, landlords have to um, um, really sign and, and uh, sign under perjury, penalty and perjury that these invoices are real. Um, a landlord's failure to comply with any of this lease transparency law may be used as an affirmative defense in an unlawful detainer action based on failure to pay building operating costs. What does that mean? Well, if let's say you refuse to pay your building operating costs or part of um, the fees and the landlord decides to take you to court in your answer, you can say, well, I didn't pay these fees because the landlord failed to provide supporting documentation. And so that's what that means. It gives tenants an extra um, line of defense. Um, and so uh, this concludes the least transparency right and honestly concludes all like the three different rights for SB 1103. Um, looking forward, I want to just emphasize what I was talking a little bit about yesterday, or not yes, <laughs> earlier, is that SB 1103 is just the start. I'm sure there are many of you sitting there thinking like, well, okay, SB 1103 doesn't actually um, apply to me because I'm not a qualified commercial tenant, or why didn't, why didn't SB 1103 include this right or that right? And that's what building momentum really means, um, I think, is that we had to start somewhere, especially in a state that didn't have many rights. And like I mentioned earlier, California is the only state with these types of rights. We did a whole survey of the United States and different um and like different state laws. And every state like lacked some sort of lease transparency, language access, or extended notice requirements. And so um Yes, we're like pioneering this and there's so much more work to do. And so SB 1103 is just the start. Um, like I mentioned, we advocate for data-driven policy solutions on both the local and statewide level. Our data comes from our direct legal services. So anytime any of you come to office hours or avail of our services through the Legal Services for Entrepreneurs program, we are taking in that information, obviously anonymously, but taking in that information, compiling the data, sharing with our statewide partners to come up with solutions that make sense um, under the law and also address and are responsive to um, the, the issues that small business owners are facing. But in addition to that, we're not doing that alone. Our clients and our community partners play a pivotal role in our policy advocacy. The picture here, um, uh, our team members with a former client, Babatunde Afalavi, who um, came to the Capitol to uh, be a uh, or provide witness testimony to the Senate on why SB 1103 is necessary. So he shared his story. He, um, you know, shared uh, examples, you know, in the city that he's from and really provided persuasive advocacy. And we were able to pass that committee hearing, um, and move on to the next step. And so, um, I, I share this story as a invitation to all who are feeling like, um, empowered and, and, and wanting to do more than just look out for your own business, but also create a great environment for in your cities and in your locations to make sure that everybody can thrive and everybody is protected. And so um, I'll end there uh, and we could start with questions. I don't know, Anna, if you had a way of doing Q&A, but uh, yeah, we were talking for a long time. So <laughs> I'm sure that there are some questions at least. Yeah, I think folks can unmute or raise their hand or if they feel more comfortable ascending through chat, that works too. Um, right. yeah, you had a question, Colette? Uh, I don't think I saw it. So um, thanks so much for this overview of, of SB 1103. It's, it's hard to believe um, 
that no other state has this and that it took you know us even a while to to get to this um because the thought of what could happen and has happened without these protections in in places it's pretty scary but um i believe you mentioned that the obviously the law doesn't go into effect until next year and so the leases um would be sorry my printer's super loud but the leases would also be post january 1 of next year as well is that correct um Yes, yeah, so SB 1103 will only apply to leases that mention building operating costs, but have been like signed or started on January 1st or after. If okay. the lease doesn't include any mention of building operating costs, then that date becomes a moot. So don't take this as legal advice because, again, disclaimer. <laughs> and I was informed by Hewitt that some folks may not have leases or written leases. Um, okay, how do I present this as non-legal advice? Okay, hypothetically, if someone were to wait for January 1st, 2025 to sign their lease, they if they're already a qualified commercial tenant, they can be, uh, or they could fall under SB 1103. I'll just put that out there. Yeah, so I appreciate that because part of what I'm, what I'm really getting at is for those that have an existing lease, is there, are there some components of that lease that they can negotiate post January 1, 2025 in order to have it fall under this new legislation. That's that's what I was thinking of, um, is what can a tenant possibly negotiate within their existing lease in order to have it fall under SB 1103? Besides, you say that, you know, the expiration of the, of the lease itself. Yeah, that's what my my mind was tracking to call it is sort of like if you time it, you know, we're only talking about a couple of months here. And so if your entry point is to renegotiate another term, that might not be relevant to what SB 1103 is talking about, but you time it so that the lease renewal or the even an amendment to the lease happens January 1, 2025. My question is, would that make um, would that make that commercial lease um, fall under the protection? of SB 1103 to Jasmine? That's a really good question. Um, I know for renewals, it will. Um, amendments, I'm not as sure. I could talk with um, our coalition about that and make bring that back as a question that um, community members had. Um, if the answer is no, right? Like, I think... A strategy would be to, and this might be too much, but a strategy would be to just terminate the existing lease and um, enter into a new one. But um, if if SB eleven oh three also applies to amended leases, which again I'll, I'll confirm, um, I don't think we, you know, you would need to go that extra step. And then the month to month tenancies. So assuming that like the lease expires and then a default to a month to month tenancy, are those tenants protected? Yes. So awesome. month to month tenancies are covered under SB 1103, regardless of date, as long as you're a qualified commercial tenant. Any other questions before we wrap this up? <laughs> well, you know where to reach us. And so we'll be following up as well, just with final closeout um, matters and sharing additional resources. But it's been an, absolutely, an absolute pleasure of ours um, to have this uh, short time together. And we hope that maybe this could be a launch into other work we can do in this movement for um, more economic justice, particularly um, in the commercial leasing dynamic, but even beyond that to support um, the corridor and the 7th Street merchants. Um, yeah, we hope to just continue our partnership together. And we hope that this series has been beneficial to you all.
Colette, did you have anything you wanted to mention or um, just wrap it up, I guess? Yeah, no, we can just wrap it up. Just a reminder, um, um, Anna put in the chat some surveys um, that we're asking everyone to complete. Um, obviously, LCCRSF has office hours as well. So feel free to reach out to them for that also. And then, um, Anna, did you want to mention the winners from the, um, the um, what do you call it, lottery, <laughs> whatever we're calling, raffle? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for the first one, um, we had Chris Barnett and Monique Brown. Um, and then the second one was Ismael and Adrian. Um, so I'll actually also reach out uh as well independently um but yeah congrats and i did get um your your message ismail so i'll reach out to you and let you know how you can you know get your prize so um yeah thanks for everyone for attending and um we will share the recording out soon as well and the presentation slides yeah this is really valuable information so that'll be really helpful thank you everyone okay. yeah this was great thank you thanks bye take care